each organism has kind of a main way of how its cells become or go through the specification process. So really this is all, all this is, is just to uh, uh, help you understand some of the mechanisms of development. So these are the three kind of main concepts. So again, autonomous specification. In organisms that undergo autonomous specification, they have the ability early on in their cells to already know what they're going to become. So if you separate them from their, the other cells, they'll still become that cell type or group of cells. And the reason for that is because the RNA that's in the cytoplasm has been sequestered to various areas of that cytoplasm so that when the cell starts undergoing mitosis and cleavage and generates the, the cells, as the cytoplasm starts partitioning itself off, each of the cells that result from that partitioning are going to uh, have their own proteins or morphogenic determinants, as we talked about morphogen gradients before. They're going to have their own proteins that will tell the cell what genes to turn on. So it doesn't necessarily need interactions with other cells to become what they're going to become. We'll see today how that's not always the case, uh, especially when dealing with vertebrates, which is where most of the development that we're going to be learning about, uh, barring one or two examples, is going to be at. Okay? Um, so whether it's a sea urchin or whatnot, these cells, when you remove them from their native environment, will still continue down the path that they were meant to go, even without interaction with other cells. That's autonomous specification. Why? That's due to the internal cytoplasmic components. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the mRNA and the subsequent proteins that get translated from that mRNA that was originally set up in the oocyte or the egg. Okay. Again, morphogen gradients. A morphogen is a protein that has the capacity to cause a change in the cell or cells that it comes in contact with. We're going to see a lot of different morphogens or signal transduction pathways that are signaled by morphogen gradients today. So again, a morphogen gradient, because of the natural process of diffusion, the cells that are secreting or making the protein will have the highest concentration of that morphogen. The cells adjacent to those that are affected by this morphogen gradient will there's certain levels of this that are going to cause certain genes to turn on. Um, as you start getting further and further away, there's a threshold, and that's the key here, there's a threshold at which point the cells at a lower amount either won't respond to it all or respond slightly differently than those adjacent to it. So if just the mere distance, and this is again where gastrulation or morphogenesis comes into play, is that as cells move around, the distance or the location in which they are in respect to one another can and does matter. And then ultimately you have cells that have little to no effect on the morphogen gradients, but even low levels of these things are important when combined with other proteins or other combinations of other morphogen gradients, as we'll show. Okay. Now, syncytial specification. Again, this is one that is pretty much in insects. And one of the prime examples that we use for this is Drosophila. And really, the main difference between syncytial specification and autonomous specification is that you still have these cytoplasmic determinants, these morphogens, or the proteins that are made from these RNA that are sequestered within the cytoplasm. The difference is the cell will actually go through multiple stages of mitosis, but not cytokinesis, and generate a number of these nuclei before cytokinesis even occurs. What's happening is these morphogenic gradients are being set up so that when the cell starts partitioning off into smaller cells, the gradients that have been set up over a period of time then become encapsulated within the individual cells, and that creates patterns of development that will play a huge role later on. In fact, we show that if you um, disrupt some of these morphogen gradients, certain parts of the Drosophila won't even form if you disrupt the, the, uh, the flow of these morphogens going from one side to the other and then being you know, um, restricted to the cytoplasm of the individual cells.
Okay, so more on that later when we get into some of the details of Drosophila. Now, you and I, as well as pretty much all vertebrates, for the most part are under what we call conditional specification, which is the fact that the cell's location and uh, um, interaction with one another does matter. So in the initial stages, we don't have things that are uh, um, sequestered in par certain parts of our cytoplasm that ultimately tell the cell what to become. In fact, in the first few stages, even that inner cell mass um, has the potential to still become every cell in an organism, which is why when you have uh, monozygotic twins, the inner cell mass of, a, um, uh, of the developing embryo, when it splits, each one become, can become its own embryo. So early on, the cells are not specified at all. It all matters on what type of interactions they end up having later in reference to the placenta, their implantation of the uterus. Again, I'm talking about in our case. In other cases, they're a little different. We'll go through some of those later on. Okay, so those are the three modes of specification. Again, conditional. If you move cells from one spot to another, and uh, they will respond differently to a different area based upon the signals, the morphogen gradients, and the cell-to-cell -cell signaling that goes on in that particular area. Now, there comes a point where the cells become determined. Remember, when they're determined, when you move them to another place, they no longer respond to various signals that are already established in their fate. So in that regard, conditional specification creates these patterns within the embryo, but only to a certain point, and then the cells uh, are, are going to, for the most part, become specified autonomously. Um, because they, they're already specified in their fate, or determined, I should say. All right, so let's talk about induction and competence. Because this is an uh, important part of um, conditional specification. Okay, so mostly what we're going to talk about right now is conditional specification and some of the factors behind it, since most of what we study is, is for the benefit of humankind, and therefore we want to look at the method of our development so we can understand stem cell therapy and other things a little bit better for us. So induction and competence. Let's define these words first and then give you some examples of how this works. When something is induced, it ultimately produces a signal or the induction process is kind of the morphogen gradients. Ultimately, these cells produce a signal, a protein, that can change the behavior of adjacent cells. So the inducer are the cells that are producing the protein, the morphogen. So induction is just the process of one cell telling another cell what to do based upon its secretion of its proteins. Or, as we'll show, sometimes just uh, uh, it doesn't actually secrete the proteins. It just kind of has some membrane proteins that will touch the other cell and still tell it what to do. Now, just because one set of cells is sending out a signal does not mean that the other cells have the capacity to respond to that. That capacity is what we call competence. So competence is the ability for the cells to be able to respond to the inducting signal. Okay? Early on, most cells are competent. But as the cells become determined, as they become determined in what fate they're going to become, their competency goes to almost zero, meaning they don't respond to any of the adjacent cells. They're already determined in what fate they're going to become. So really, induction and competence are in the earliest stages of specification when one cell is giving a signal and the other cell can respond to it. Now, there's always an inducer and a responding tissue. So cell induction requires two, two types of tissues, one that is secreting the protein and the other that is typically responding. There are situations where it's its own inducer, meaning some cells can release something and that just auto-regulates its own cells. But most of the time, it's one tissue or one group of cells that are secreting a protein that causes another group of proteins to respond. Now, it matters what type of gradient is being uh, sent uh, um, or what type of morphogen. For example, here we have, this is, these are some samples or examples that you'll see in your book. Here we have just basic ectoderm, or the epidermal tissue that will become the ectoderm, uh, or, or ectoderm components uh, of, in this case, uh, looking probably at a, a bird. Uh, 
Over here, we have different types of inducing tissues. This tissue comes from the mesoderm where the wing forms. This tissue comes from the mesoderm where the leg forms, and this tissue comes from the mesoderm where the foot forms. So this is the same tissue that is receiving the signal, but each one of these mesoderms are expressing a different morphogen gradient. So what happens is, due to the fact that each gradient is different, is maybe a different protein, the same tissue will respond differently based upon what the inducing tissue is giving. For example, if you put wing mesoderm under this, it will form into wing feathers. If you put thigh mesoderm under here, it'll form into thigh feathers, which are different. And then, of course, if you put foot mesoderm under here, it'll form into the claw in this regard. So even though this tissue, it is fully competent to become any component of the ectoderm, of the uh, organism, it matters what the inducing tissue is, okay? So this is the factors. The reason why each one of these is different because they're expressing some different myriad of proteins or combinations of proteins that, that do that. Now, in some cases, you have what's called reciprocal induction, where one induces one and then the other one in turn induces the other. So you have this crosstalk between the, the tissues. It's not always just one's the inducer and one's the responder. Sometimes this tells us what to do, and then in turn, this one comes around and tells the other one, okay, now you do this, okay? And that kind of falls into line with a, a concept called sequential inductive events, which just means tissue, as it develops, sometimes goes through this stepwise process that does matter in terms of its overall development, meaning you can't skip steps. You have to first uh, give it this protein and it does something. And then you give it another protein, and it does something, and so on and so forth. It can't respond to the second protein until the first one's done its job. So sequential induction events, that's really how most things develop in you and I. It's never just one type of induction. It's this, and then it's this, and then it's this. And that's ultimately what caused these tissues to go down their particular fate, is multiple inductive events that develop the system overall. It's a very complex process. Now, here's an interesting thing. A lot of the morphogen gradients that we're going to talk about today, as well as their subsequent signal transduction pathways, are almost universal in some organisms, meaning we and other uh, vertebrates and even some invertebrates use some of the same proteins to pattern the brain or to pattern the, the ectoderm or whatnot. The difference is the genetic capacity of those tissues to respond to that. Now, what am I talking about? Well, here's an example where they did a transplantation experiment. They took a newt and a frog, which are similar or closely related to one another in their genetics, and they took the tissue from the frog and put it where the newt's at, or they did the, the opposite. They took it from the newt and put it in this area where the frog was at. Well, what ended up happening was the frog tissue tells this region is supposed to become, um, uh, well, in this case, it's supposed to become uh, um, the suckers that are uh, on a frog tadpole. Well, in this regard, the, the newt responds in kind to whatever the frog is inducing. Well, over here, the frog has these newt balancers because that's what the tissue knows to be able to respond to. So even though they both have the same inductive tissue, there's only a limited capacity on what the, uh, uh, the tissue is supposed to be able to do. For example, here in the newt, normally under this signal, the tissue would respond and become um, balancers, but it becomes only what it knows what it can become, and in this case, it's the frog suckers from that tissue. So the long and the short of this experiment is showing you that you may have the same inductive tissue, say that this mesoderm tells the ectoderm to become a feather, but if we don't make feathers, we're not going to make feathers, we're going to make skin, you know, under those same conditions. There's a limited capacity to what this. It's not going to say, hey, you're supposed to become feathers, so make feathers. There's no genetic capacity in those cells to do that. But they will respond in whatever capacity they know how to respond. So we can't really generate feathers in our skin because we don't have the genetics to do so. But we would respond to the same signal, and instead of producing a feather, we would produce hair or something of that nature. 
Okay? That's kind of the idea behind here is that the inductive signals are the same between species, but the tissue has a limited capacity, depending upon the species, on how it's going to respond. All right. It'll, it'll respond as it knows how to in, in its genetics. Okay. Um, last types of interactions before we move on. Instructive interaction is um, ultimately, this is where um, a lot of the conditional specification comes into play, was that you have to have, the cells are periodically telling these other cells what to do. Okay? They, they can't respond autonomously, they don't develop autonomously. In order for the genes to be turned on, it has to ha receive this signal from the inducing tissue. So instructive interaction is one of those things where the morphogen gradient must be present in order for the cells to be able to respond. However, there comes a point where the tissue starts going down this process of specification and it has everything it needs. It's almost autonomous. It just needs the right environment to finish off. So permissive interaction is one of those things where the tissue has already gone through those stages of induction and it's almost ready to be finished off. It doesn't need any more instruction from any other tissues. But you still have to keep it in that environment because there are other factors. Maybe there's a extracellular matrix that the cells need to be able to maintain that. Maybe they need to be in contact with other cells. They don't necessarily need an inducer. They just need the, the appropriate environment which typically means that they're touching other cells and they've got, uh, um, uh, they have the same conditions that they um, uh, need in order for that. So it's kind of splitting hairs, but these are kind of different levels of specification. Instructive is the earliest stages. Permissive is the late stages of specification where the cells are almost committed, almost determined to be what they are and they just need to be maintained in that environment and then they're ready to go. This is just to give you some basic concepts of the complexity of, uh, um, of induction, of conditional specification where cells, you can see it's not just, hey, throw some morphogen gradients. There's a lot of things. It's you induce me, I induce you, I can respond this way, you go through the sequential. That's really all I'm after here is that you understand some of the complexity here. So let's go into some of the uh, um, things regarding cell signal. Let's get into the actual morphogen gradients, the signaling, and what role they play in development. Okay? And you're going to see these signal transduction pathways throughout the entire semester. You're going to see sonic hedgehog. We talked about competence. Okay? Remember, competence is actually the, uh, um, the more competent a cell is, typically the more pluripotent it is, meaning it has the ability to bind to and respond to the various tissues. Now, if you look at the human body and you look at all of our tissues, each tissue has a very limited level of competence. What am I talking about? Well, we release hormones all the time, but the hormones will only affect those tissues that are actually expressing the receptor for that hormone. So if we have a growth hormone, only the cell, well, a lot of the cells in our body respond to growth hormone, but only the cells that have that particular receptor will respond in that, re in that regard. So you can just, this is one of the things about development is you can send all these proteins out into the ether, so to speak, or into the area, and only those cells that have the receptor to respond to that will respond. And that's where competence comes, in, comes into play. Um, and that's built up over time, over the early stages of induction that start telling them to, to express certain receptors. So let me show you how this works. So let's say this is the inducer right here. It throws out this triangle-shaped protein. And notice, this cell doesn't have a receptor that will bind that properly. So guess what? It doesn't respond. This is what we would call non-competent. So non-competent cells are cells that cannot respond to a morphogen gradient, to some particular factor. Whereas competent cells are cells that can respond. So competency is relative. If we say a cell is competent, you have to ask, say, what is it competent to? Okay, so competency is relative to the actual inducing signal. This cell right here is the inducer. These are the ones that respond to it, the responder. Okay, 
So here, what happens, and this is what we're going to go over for the rest of today's class, is when the protein targets a particular receptor on the surface of the, of the membrane, then it starts this cascade of events in the cytoplasm that typically turn transcription on. That's the ultimate goal here, is that it causes new genes to be transcribed and translated, and that in turn causes this cell to start acting differently, creates new receptors that then might respond to a different signal. You know, So that's really what this is all about, is that in the earliest stages, the cells will start turning on various receptors, and certain cells are competent to certain inductive signals. Others are not competent to other inductive signals. Here's an example of how this works. Eye formation, very complex process, but typically there is a tissue that is necessary to cause the uh, lens to start forming, the induction of the lens by the optic vesicle. Now, if you take that tissue and transplant it to, say, this lower region of the embryo where the trunk is at, due to the history of this tissue, it doesn't have the receptors for that morphogen gradient. Over here, if you remove the actual inducer, notice this tissue right here, it won't actually form a lens. There's no signal being produced, and so the responder can't do anything. Again, conditional specification. This tissue must be present for this to become the lens. Otherwise, there's no signal for it to be induced to, to have that. Um, if you take some other tissue, other than the optic vesicle, and put it in there, it shows that because it doesn't have the same morphogen gradient, it still won't induce it to become lens. So they did this because they wanted to see, well, what if there's just tissue there? Let's just replace it with a different tissue, and the mere nature of having tissue there doesn't cause that to become the lens. It has to have a very specific protein or proteins that are being secreted by this tissue for that to develop into the lens of the eye. We've talked a lot about transcription factors, and that's what we're going to focus on here, is the transcription factors is the ultimate goal of these, what we call, signal transduction pathways. Many times, these transcription factors are either available in the cell, but cannot go into the nucleus. Okay? So the cell will, will make these transcription factors in the cytoplasm, but keep them out of the nucleus. And the only way that these transcription factors can come into the nucleus to start transcribing genes uh, you know, when they're induced, when the cells are induced, is when they receive a signal from another cell, which is the induction process, essentially. So a lot of times, remember I told you how sometimes um, cells will make proteins, and then they'll destroy those proteins. Well, this is an example. Uh, we're going to show you a couple of examples of how this is done, where they'll make these transcription factors, but they'll eat, and then they'll destroy them. But they're in the process of constantly making these until the moment that the cell gets some signal from another cell. The moment it gets that cell, boom, the protein stops being degraded, it comes into the nucleus, and immediately the cell can respond to that signal. That's one of the reasons why the cell would create these transcription factors, only to destroy them so that it can be available in a moment's notice, because there are certain things that have to happen almost instantaneously in development to be able to respond. It can't wait half an hour or an hour to start making these and then say, okay, now I'm ready to respond to this signal. So many of these pathways that I'm going to talk about are proteins that are constantly being made and set up so that at a moment's notice, the cell can respond to an inductive signal. And this is where differential gene expression comes into play. When it gets a signal, then these transcription factors are allowed into the nucleus, and then certain genes are transcribed based upon the inductive signal. Okay? Signal transduction pathways. That's what we're going to spend the rest of the time on. We may or may not get through all of this. This is where a lot of your questions are going to come into play as well. Because from here on out, when we start talking about vertebrate development, you're going to see these genes all the time. Sonic hedgehog, wind signaling, Hux genes, all of these types of things that, that come into play. So in almost all these cases, you essentially have some protein 
which we call a, uh, a ligand. So in the case of a, a protein that is secreted by another cell, that morphogen gradient, there's a specific name for it. We call it a ligand. Okay? Ligand is a term you're going to have to know. So the ligand, or the protein, and then the receptor that's found on the surface of the cell. The receptor, again, this is where competence comes into play, must match the ligand. So the ligand and the receptor have to be compatible. This is where induction and competence ultimately come together. The ligand is the inducer or the protein being secreted by the inducer, and the receptor is the cell's competence or ability to respond to that ligand. Ultimately, it's not about the ligand receptor. It's about what happens once they come together. It's about the internal cellular processes of the responding tissue and what gene transcription or sometimes repression comes into place. Not always about turning genes off, sometimes it's about turning genes, or, or turning genes on, it's about turning genes off. Okay? Because as we talked about during the commitment process where they become determined, it's not just about some genes being turned on. Some transcription factors will turn some genes on and shut other genes off at the same time. So there's dual purposes in some of these transcription factors. That repression ultimately makes it so that the cells stay the way that they are, that they're going to become skin even if they have other signals coming into play. So that repression can sometimes shut off a receptor so that the cell is no longer competent to the signal. You see how complex this can start to get. Okay. All right. Now, again, I mentioned this before, is that there's only so many proteins that are made in nature. And what's fascinating is we know a lot about how humans develop, not because of we, us studying human embryology, but because we study all these other organisms which have the same induction methods that we do. They use the same proteins that we do to make the heart, to make the kidney, to make our teeth. So even though we have different genetics, the proteins that cause hearts to form in all vertebrates is pretty much the same, or proteins that are used are almost the same. Now, yes, there are differences between, say, insects and vertebrates because of uh, 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 the dynamics, but in fact, we do have similarities even there. Even though the proteins aren't exactly the same, they are very closely related. We'll talk more about that in evolution as far as paralogs and orthologs um, in terms of the proteins and evolutionary development. So the same proteins. As we study vertebrates, fish and birds and other mammals and things like that, we are actually studying ourselves because we use some, uh, uh, pretty much the same proteins in a lot of these processes. The, these are a lot of the dynamics that go into signal transduction pathways. You actually have these huge families of ligands and receptors. Like I said, of the Pax genes, there are eight, uh, seven, eight, I think at least eight of those. Hox genes, there's, there's uh, four main groups, but then there's subgroups within those. Um, you've got Wint Frizzled family, where you've got, um, I think 14 different combinations and whatnot. So there's a great amount of complexity as far as ligand receptors. Um, when you look at the receptors themselves, you actually don't just have one receptor. Sometimes you've got to have the right combination of two different receptors. And this is where we have co-receptors and dimerization coming into play. Sometimes the receptors are the same, which is uh, where the homo comes in. Hetero is where the receptors are different, yet they must be both be present for the cell to be able to respond to that type of interaction. You don't just, in, in some of these pathways we're going to go through, um, sometimes there are like three or four different ways that the same signal can go through. So, you know, we have what we call the canonical WINT pathway, and then we have the non canonical WINT pathway. And so we've talked about sequential induction. Again, the history, the history of the cell. In one period of time, a certain uh, signal transduction pathway tells the cell to do one thing, and then a little bit later, because of this sequential induction, the same pathway can tell it to do something completely different. Okay? So 
Again, it's not as simple as saying, oh, this one does this all the time. Nope. In this circumstance, at this particular time in the cell's history, it might tell it to do this. At another time in the cell's history, it might tell us to do something completely different. Uh, an example of this is when neurons are finding their muscle or their target where they're supposed to go. In some cases, the neuron has to, you know, to go down its pathway, it receives a certain signal. And then at a certain point, all of a sudden, that signal doesn't repel it anymore. It actually tracks it. It comes across. And then it goes through a certain point, And then it repels it all over again. So it matters as far as when, where, and its overall history on how the tissue is going to respond to that same signal transduction pathway. Competitive and inhibitory regulatory, uh, regulators. What this means is there's a, a lot of um, uh, morphogens, gradients and such, that can actually compete with one another. When you have two different gradients hitting each other at the same time, sometimes the proteins can interact and completely cancel each other out. So there's competition between some of these signals. And that's a good thing because it creates different levels of, of uh, uh, a morphogen that the cells can actually respond to. It's not just high to low levels. Sometimes you get this you know, crosstalk between them and you have different you know, uh, uh, types of inhibition that regulate how much morphogen they're being, uh, is attaching to them. And then of course, finally, sometimes the cells are their own inducers where they start something and then they just kind of keep the cycle going. And it, it requires another cell to come in here and say, okay, stop. You know, there's, there's this positive feedback loop sometimes with some of these signal transduction pathways where they'll just keep, once they've been triggered, they'll just keep going without any other stimulus. And then they need something else to come in and say, okay, stop, stop. You don't need to do that anymore. There are four ways that cells can communicate with one another. The main one that I've been telling you about is called paracrine signaling. And this is the one that we're gonna spend most of our time on in development. What is paracrine? It is when the, the proteins from the inducing tissue are secreted out into the extracellular space where you have this diffusion coming out from the, the inducer cells that then spread out and start affecting all these other tissues. That's paracrine signaling. So paracrine is when the protein is secreted from these cells. Juxtacrine is where the, the inducing ligand is actually bound to the membrane of a cell. This restricts its ability to only induce adjacent tissue. So it doesn't actually secrete the protein, it makes the protein and it is usually a membrane protein. So juxtacrine is where you get just cell-cell contact and the prime example that we're gonna go through here is notch signaling. Most everything we're going to go through today is paracrine signaling, but notch delta uh, signaling is, is an example of juxtacrine, which is used in nervous system development. Autocrine, this is when the cell secretes a signal and it induces itself. So autocrine can be paracrine in nature, but instead of inducing other tissues, it just induces itself. So uh, I, I, we're not going to talk too much about autocrine. And so the difference between endocrine and paracrine is that endocrine is when the organism, typically those that have a cardiovascular system, secrete them into the cardiovascular system, travels through, and it induces other tissues through that mechanism. So that's the main difference here is endocrine is through the blood. Paracrine, you can see here in this example, it's secreting proteins. These are, this creates a gradient, a morphogen gradient. Juxtacrine. They can either have the extracellular matrix, which is a series of proteins that can induce the tissue, or it can actually have physical contact between one membrane and another membrane of those. Those are both juxtacrine. And then autocrine and endocrine, we went through those. Let's focus on paracrine and juxtacrine. Those are the two that I'm gonna want you to explain to me and be able to describe. This picture just kind of shows the same thing of uh, the, the different types of, you know, how you have autocrine and it just keeps signaling to itself or if you have, here's a, an example of a reciprocal induction of paracrine signaling, where one uh, secretes a protein that induces this one, this one secretes a protein and induces that one, and they just keep going back and forth. You'll see a, a good example of this too and, uh, later on. 
All right, paracrine signaling. These are some of the main pathways that we're going to study this semester in, in development. Wind frizzled pathway, hedgehog signaling, mostly it's sonic hedgehog, but there are actually three different types of hedgehogs in this family. FGF or fibroblast growth factor, uh, part of that is what's called the RTK path. You've got the uh, SMAD signal transduction pathway. The main one that we're going to focus on is the BMP, bone morphogenic protein. This is a huge one in development, BMP, bone morphogenic protein. Just kind of to give you a heads up, as we'll talk about sonic hedgehog and BMP, these are pretty much antagonists of one another. In fact, that antagonism is what causes the development of your central nervous system uh, as far as your brain and your spinal column. This pathway is very instrumental in a number of different processes. And again, the same pathway can affect multiple processes based upon the history of the cell. So here are all the things that it affects. It affects you know, gene expression, obviously, as most of these do. Uh, the differentiation, polarity, because there is polarity in cells. In fact, that's why your stem cells remain stem cells, is because when they divide, the stem cells divide in a particular direction so that one of them is maintained in the environment to keep its stem cell nature, and the other ones go off in a different direction and are, uh, are exposed to different signals, and they become something else. In fact, that's how your bone marrow works, and that's how a number of tissues work, is the polarity of the cells, and it matters what direction they they divide in. Motility, we talked about uh, how you go through these transitions, you know, epithelial to mesenchyme, remember uh, uh, um, cadherins, the, the expression of cadherins and things that ultimately have to do with the mobility and morphology of the cells and where they're at and where they're going and things of that sort, okay? Cancer, this is a big one, especially today. This is where a lot of research is today is in the wind frizzle pathway, because as I just mentioned, there is a mutation that is an oncogene. An oncogene, which is a dominant mutation that causes cells to become cancerous. Now, what do you think connection there is between the wind frizzle pathway and cancer? What's one of the things you see up there that I just talked about that has to do with cancer? Proliferation, Proliferation exactly. So the wind signaling pathway is still in effect today in your tissues that affects proliferation. And mutations in this pathway, and this is where a lot of cancer research comes into play too, is that there's an oncogene that is prevalent that causes massive cell proliferation. And it's turned on all the time. And we need to figure out how to turn it off in some of these cancers. Okay, so here is a list of a number of processes in which it's involved in. Okay, it's in, it's in everything. In fact, wind signaling is almost in everything. When we say gastrulation, that's a, a term we haven't gone over yet. It's just cell movement. It's just the movement of the cells during the development of the three germ layers. So remember the cadherins? Yeah, this is the process. Uh, wind frizzled pathways have uh, everything to do with gastrulation and, and where the cells are, are moving and things of that sort. Polarity, limb polarity is determined by wind signaling. Why doesn't our hands kind of go this way? Why are palms on the inside instead of on the outside of both of these? That has to do with wind signaling. Um, kidney formation, muscle development, eyes, it's everything. I mean, it's, it's almost all of these organs and tissues that we, we deal with. So wind, wind frizzled is a, a big thing that we're studying. So let's look at the, this pathway for a little bit. There are many wind ligands, and there are many frizzled receptors. Um, the overall morphology of the receptor, it passes through the membrane seven times, so that's why it's called a seven-pass transmembrane protein. I don't worry too much about that. These are just some of the details. All right, here's the basis of how it works. Over here on the left is the shorthand. Now, the Wnt ligand being secreted by the inducer will hit cells that have the frizzled receptor. Okay? These frizzled receptors are in the membrane. Now, attached to this frizzled receptor is a protein called disheveled. Normally, disheveled will not be released from frizzled. It always stays in combination with the frizzled receptor. So as long as the Wnt ligand is not there, this stays together. Okay? But as soon as the Wnt ligand hits this receptor, it releases disheveled. Okay? Now, here's an example of what I was telling you before, where it makes 
proteins, like a transcription factor, but it degrades that protein. The protein that in question is beta-catenin. This is a big one. This is one dealing with cancer. This is one where you have a mutation in this and it causes cancer, an oncogene. Beta-catenin. So what is beta-catenin? Well, beta-catenin is a transcription factor. It essentially is a protein that, when it goes into the nucleus, will combine with other proteins and cause transcription to occur um, in the DNA. But even though beta-catenin is translated and made, there are other proteins, JSK3 is one of these in particular, that causes beta-catenin to be tagged for destruction. So the proteasomes will come in here and they'll say, oh, okay, just keep destroying it. So as beta-catenin is being made, it keeps being tagged for destruction. It just keeps being destroyed. It's only when disheveled gets released from the frizzled receptor that it comes in here and says, stop. Stop destroying beta-catenin. So it'll actually prevent beta-catenin from being tagged for destruction. And then, guess what? Beta-catenin now enters into the nucleus and can initiate transcription. So under normal conditions, beta-catenin is constantly being degraded in the cell. But when Wnt signaling hits this frizzled receptor, then it stops beta-catenin being de degraded, and beta-catenin goes into the nucleus, and you start getting transcription of some of these genes. That's the Wnt. That's the canonical Wnt signaling pathway. That's the main one. That's the only one that I want you to really know. There are many others. Now, what causes cancer? What's a particular mutation that causes cancer? Well, again, when signaling uh, uh, um, the, the pathway, beta-catenin will turn on genes that increase cell growth and proliferation and, and so on and so forth. There's a mutation, and usually the mutation is on the beta-catenin, but sometimes it's on other proteins. For example, this protein right here, which binds beta-catenin, APC. But what happens is if the mutation is on either one of these proteins, well, due to that slight change in the protein structure, it can't be tagged for degradation. It won't bind to this complex, and it won't be degraded. So guess what? The cell keeps producing this problematic beta-catenin, and the beta-catenin keeps causing cell proliferation, and there you got cancer. So this is a problem today in a lot of cancers, not all, but in a lot of cancers, there is this oncogene that is a mutated form of this protein, which basically turns cell proliferation on all the time. Okay. So this is just an example of how you want beta-catenin destroyed until the cell receives that signal to, to uh, uh, stop destroying it. And then only under those conditions will the cell increase its growth, increase its cell division rate, and stuff like that. So lots of Wnt families. Between vertebrates and invertebrates, there's 19 alone that are in the human um, family uh, or in the human cells that we use. But there are others that are found in other organisms as well. Okay, so again, each one can have slightly different. These frizzles are found in the midbrain. These are found in the somites. These are found in the neural plate. So the pathway is the same. This is all beta-catenin and transcription or whatnot. But let's say you take these cells from the midbrain, hindbrain, and you put them down at the somites. Remember, we talked about competence. They're not going to be competent because they're not expressing the same frizzled as this tissue. So the Wnt ligand that's expressed in this area will only affect these cells that have this frizzled 7 receptor, not any cells that have the frizzled 1 receptor. Okay? So again, competence. They have to have the, the appropriate receptor for the ligand in that particular area for them to be able to be induced. Hedgehog signaling. Um, there's sonic hedgehog. There's Indian hedgehog. And there is, uh, I can't remember the third one. Um, the main one is sonic hedgehog. So in the hedgehog pathway, you have actually a receptor and another membrane protein that's not a receptor but plays a vital role in this. And this is called patched, which is the receptor, and smoothened, which is a transmembrane protein. These are, you know, ultimately bound together. Now, the ligand is sonic hedgehog, okay? So the main one we're going to talk about is sonic hedgehog. That's the ligand. The receptor is patched, okay? So sonic hedgehog is the ligand patched to the receptor. 
What happens is, under normal conditions, the, this is more of a repressive pathway, where when there is no ligand, then a series of proteins will actually cut uh, this CI protein, and it will sit on the promoter region of various key genes that will prevent transcription factors that are present from activating gene expression. So what happens here is when you get hedgehog bound to here, then you get, um, uh, you ultimately prevent the cleavage of the CI. Well, this then, instead of becoming an inhibitor, goes in and now becomes an activator and will actually initiate transcription. So when it's cleaved, it's a repressor. When this protein's cleaved, it's a repressor. When it's activated or when it's not cleaved, when it enters into the nucleus, it'll actually turn on transcription. Okay, and then here are some of the developmental functions. Um, Left-right axis, again, polarity in development. Huge thing, especially in limb development um, and in the formation. Sonic hedgehog plays a huge role in, uh, uh, especially of your digits as well, of your fingers and your toes um, of how they form. FGF, or fibroblast growth factor signaling. This is a big one. This is one that has a lot of factors to it. Fibroblast growth factor expression, or FGF. Typically, FGF, fibroblast growth factor, is the ligand, and the receptors we just call FGFR, fibroblast growth factor receptors. So this one's pretty easy. FGF is the ligand, FGFR is the receptor. There's really no special names like patched and smoothened and whatnot. Um, again, there are different varieties of these, of the FGFs as well as the FGFRs. Um, one of the biggest ones I was studying in my development was FGFR4. So there are subtypes of each of these receptors that play key roles at different times in development. Mostly what FGF signaling is, is phosphorylation, or a subgroup of this is um, receptor tyrosine kinase signaling or RTK signaling. So all, what this is, is typically you get phosphorylation events in the presence of the ligand and the receptor. This is where you get these dimers or dimerization of the receptors. It's not just one receptor, it's actually two. And in the presence of the ligand, what will happen is the two receptors will come in close contact with one another. They'll phosphorylate each other. That phosphorylation will then be passed on to other uh, proteins, which will eventually come into the nucleus and initiate gene transcription. So this one's pretty simple. In the absence of ligand, there's no phosphorylation, there's no phosphorylation of the proteins, and there's no gene transcription. But in the presence of the ligand, then you essentially have this dimerization of the two proteins. They phosphorylate each other, which in turn then phosphorylates other proteins. Notice we're not even giving you the names of them. It's just a phosphorylation event that goes from one protein to the next. Now, in the situation of the receptor tyrosine kinase, this is just one example of FGF signaling, where these are the major players. These are the proteins that this phosphorylates that, and this phosphorylates that, and this phosphorylates that, or this prevents phosphorylation, and so on and so forth. Again, the mechanics of this are not critical for this class but rather just understanding how, how this process works. You have two receptors, you have a ligand, and when those are all present, then the combination of all of those factors causes phosphorylation that gets passed from one protein to the next until you eventually have uh, uh, these transcription factors being able to enter into the nucleus and initiate key transcription of certain genes. Here's an in situ hybridization. Remember, this was one of the processes we talked about. Wherever there's purple, you're actually getting a chemical reaction of where RNA is being expressed. So here, they're actually looking at where the ligand, FGF, is being expressed. This is, these are the types of cells. Again, this tells us quite a bit. Here's where limb development comes into play. FGF is expressed. This is even before the limb buds start forming. Uh, that will eventually become the arms and the legs, that you can see that this signaling plays a key role in very restricted areas of the embryo to turn on key genes for limb growth, as well as the midbrain, hindbrain boundary and brain development, as well as in somites and such. So we're going to see 
number of factors this semester on how that plays a key role. So midbrain, hindbrain boundary, eye formation, limb. This is where we're going to spend a lot of time when we get to the chapter on limb formation is FGF signaling. Even angiogenesis, the formation of the cardiovascular system and new blood vessels and things of that sort plays a role um, uh, in, in that, especially today. Angiogenesis even today is occurring when your body reconstructs capillaries because of clogs due to the nature of capillaries being one cell thick. You get clogs all the time and your body can initiate new capillary formation to go around blockages and it uses FGF signaling to do so. In fact, there are drugs that can block angiogenesis that are used typically to slow down the progression of cancer um, uh, because of these growth factors that are secreted. Um, the JAK STAT pathway is another example of FGF, of the FGF family, of FGF signaling. Again, ligand, dimerization of receptors, phosphorylation. In this case, you get two proteins phosphorylating each other, and the same thing occurs, goes into the nucleus, initiates transcription. So these are just some of the examples of uh, pathways that you might read about in the book. They're not absolutely essential to memorize. Again, it's not a, a factor of, I want you to know the names of all of these types of proteins, but you know, it's the same process. In this case, these aren't homodimers, they're heterodimers, which means that the, the receptors are actually different than one another. And in these cases, when you get these FGF signalings, you can either have homodimerization where the receptors are the same, or heterodimerization where the receptors are different, and that is what creates some of the differences between the ligand receptor response uh, in these pathways. So again, this just shows phosphorylation, 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 so on and so forth. And these are just some of the developmental functions. Now, the last major family of paracrine signaling is the uh, TGF beta or BMP or bone morphogenic protein. Um, uh, this is a huge, huge ligand. BMPs are found everywhere in development. They are not just involved in bone development, but they're involved in just so many other things. They're involved in neural development. Uh, in fact, this is an antagonist of sonic hedgehog. So, Whereas the ventral neural tube develops from sonic hedgehog, the dorsal neural tube develops because of bone morphogenic proteins, or BMP. So this is a huge family of signals. Again, in this regard, we have heterodimerization, so two different receptors. And again, in similar fashion, we have phosphorylation events where proteins will be phosphorylated. You get certain junctions of, of different kinds of proteins, depending upon the ligand. Sometimes you have a TGF beta, Sometimes you have a BMP, and that can actually affect what uh, uh, proteins you have associated uh, with one another, and then differ in its overall gene transcription. So here's an example of a pathway where, depending upon which ligand is secreted, in one case, you get a different gene being transcribed. In another case, same pathway, but due to the different nature of phosphorylation, you'll get different genes being turned on. So this is one of the reasons, too, why the receptor ligand combination does matter, because it will turn on different genes as an end result of which ligand causes these phosphorylation events of, uh, with which um, uh, proteins in the pathway. So BMPs, again, are not just for bone development. They're for uh, axis formation. They're for neural development. Sex determination, this is a huge one in, in causing uh, the sex organs to develop along various pathways, sperm formation. Um, they were originally called BMPs because they were discovered in terms of bo bone morphogenesis. However, they found that it was applied to many other different applications in development as well. But the, the name BMP stuck. So they're called BMPs, or bone morphogenic proteins. These are the ligands. BMP is the ligand. There is only one juxtacrine signaling that we're going to go over. Cell cells touching. This is where you don't secrete the ligand, but it requires cell cell contact for this signaling to occur. The primary signal is notch delta. This is a big one that's used in development. So the way that notch delta signaling works is notch is um, 
Notch and delta are two transmembrane proteins. When they come in contact with one another, then there is a protease in the cell expressing notch that will cleave the, this cytoplasmic portion, and that then goes in and, and completes the complex of transcription factors that initiates gene transcription. So the cell expressing notch is the one influenced by notch delta signaling. But it does require adjacent cells to be expressing delta for this to be able to occur. By itself, notch will not allow the protease to break off its cytoplasmic region. It must be in contact with an adjacent cell with the transmembrane, uh, uh, transmembrane delta. This is primarily used in the development of neurons. So what happens is, in the presence of this signaling, you get transcription of various genes, and you get neurogenesis occurring. Okay, um, It's a complex process of turning on this gene, which then turns off those, and then uh, affects this one here, and so on and so forth. So notch delta is a juxtacrine signaling. That's the only one that you're going to have to know about that we're going to show. Okay. It's cell-cell contact. There is no release. So really, it requires adjacent cells to express one protein and the other adjacent ones to express another. There isn't a large influence or morphogen gradient that occurs from notch delta signaling. Okay, So primarily in ver uh, nervous system development, there is some optic nerves and glial cells in the eye. But again, most of this is neuron development. That's the primary role of notch delta signaling. Caspase pathway is one of many pathways that is part of programmed cell death. Now, you might not think that death is a key component of development, but without death, without cell death, this happens. You create three times the number of neurons that you actually need for the development of your central nervous system. If there is no apoptosis, as there is the case in this knockout mouse, his brain is three times as large as it should be, and of course this mouse dies. But it's not going to make it smarter <laughs> and whatnot. Without apoptosis, you cannot shape the organs in the way that they're supposed to. There must be cell death during development. So one of the triggers that is necessary that we're finding is the caspase pathway, which is still in effect as an adult, can be triggered via certain chemicals and, and methods. And during development, the same thing holds true. Some of these pathways that we just talked about, signal transduction pathways, can and do induce apoptosis. For example, BMP, bone morphogenic protein. If you don't have BMPs, you get webbed fingers and toes. If you don't have BMPs, at a critical point to turn on apoptosis, then the tissue that develops in between the digits does not degenerate and it causes webbing. In fact, that is the main difference between chicken's feet and duck's feet. Duck have webbed feet, chickens don't. And it's due to apoptosis in the chicken versus not in the duck that causes that webbing or not webbing uh, of the uh, digits. So. Apoptosis versus necrosis. Necrosis is not programmed cell death. Necrosis is a pathological death that comes about due to environmental conditions, a lysis, an inflammation. Um, this is what causes damage to tissue. So if you get inflammation, that typically is going to cause necrosis. You get necrosis of you know, damaged tissues and swelling and lysing of cells. They release their contents. They cause further inflammation and other problems. Apoptosis causes the cells to basically package up the key components without dumping all of its contents to the environment, and it, 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 then it gets absorbed by various cells. So apoptosis is a very well clean way of causing the cells to be destroyed. Necrosis is typically due to damage, chemical, physical damage, and, uh, environmental, viral, things of that sort. So apoptosis is still occurring even today. In fact, when apoptosis doesn't occur, that's when cancer sets in. 
cancer typically comes about because of a cell's inability to kill itself off because it starts going wrong in terms of its genetics and, and such. So again, apoptosis, it can be triggered by many different ways. But in development, it is typically triggered via signal transduction pathways. It is supposed to happen at certain times and in certain places, in brain development, in digit formation, in organ formation, apoptosis is right along cell growth or proliferation. So it's a key concept of development.